The scripture reading for this morning is found in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. On their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. Do you ever wonder why something like that never happens to you when you go to church? I mean, you should say, sure, if that the building would start to shake, then that would get my attention. I know that, that God had, had been here. That's what the perfect church would be like. That's what the ideal church would be like, as we've been looking at the different elements of the ideal church. It would certainly be that church where you could encounter the living God and you'd be shaken by his very presence. Well, I hope you see the fallacy in that kind of thinking, that that's what has to happen before you have that ideal church. Because first of all, if you really thought about what is going on when we meet together in the name of Jesus, we probably would feel more like the building is actually shaking. Because God is here, not just because he's everywhere. So, of course, he's here too. But God is present in this place where his people have gathered for that sole purpose of meeting with him. And he wants to meet with us. He wants us to know and to feel his presence. He wants us to leave this place different than how we came in. He wants to shake us up. And there's absolutely no reason why you couldn't come here anytime that we worship and experience that supernatural presence of God. In fact, if you come week after week and you do not experience, then I really don't know why you keep coming back. It's not that I don't want you to come back. I sure do. But I don't know why you would because God is here. And he's here in a special way, in a way that it should make you hardly wait to be able to come back to church the next time. And if you do come and you feel that you have not been able to meet with Almighty God, I can't tell you that the reason is not because the music wasn't good enough. It's not because the room was too cold or too hot or too drafty or too stuffy. It's not because the sermon wasn't inspirational enough, although I'm sure you could hear better ones elsewhere. But if you come and go without experiencing the presence of God, it's because you came and went for some other reason, because God is here and he wants you to know him. He wants you to talk to him. He wants you to listen to him. He wants you to encounter him. And so God's presence should shake you up, just like it did for the Jerusalem church. The challenge of God's will and call in your life should rattle you to the point where you have to accept it and and do your best to fulfill it as you leave this place and live your life in the week to come. Because the contrast between life in the world where God's presence seems so distant and life in the church where God's people have gathered for that purpose to worship him should be so startling to you that you are just shaken into a new reality. In 1963, David Lodge, who was a British novelist, was in a theater watching a play that he had written. It was a comedy and in which the, the actor was supposed to look all bored and apathetic by listening to a transistor radio. Remember those? And uh, during um, an interview, he was just listening to the radio. And so during the play, the actor w- would always turn the radio to an actual news broadcast. Well, suddenly, 1963, came the announcement that President Kennedy had been shot. And so immediately the audience, the actors, the stage crew, everybody forgot about that imaginary plot that was being portrayed on the stage and they were shaken into the reality of what had just broken into their lives. 
Sometimes we get so nonchalant about our spiritual lives that it seems like we're in some kind of play that, that we're acting out. Even when we come to church, everybody's, everybody's got a part, everybody knows their lines, everything goes along smoothly, but how we need God to break through that and his presence in our very midst should be something that would just shake us up and make us pay attention to what is really most real. So don't let church be some sort of performance that you go to see. But let God's presence shake you up and change your life. God's presence should not only shake you up, but it should also break you up. I've heard some preachers say that God can only use you once you've been broken. There's a lot of truth to that. But it doesn't mean that you have to go through some kind of tragedy and, or have your life just shattered before you can be of any use to God. Although for those to whom this has happened, there may never be a time when the presence of God is so real. In times of greatest trial and persecution and, and heartache, God is there. He is a source of help. He is a source of comfort. He's a source of strength and of peace and of hope. Many who have been broken by life's hardships have found that their problems have actually drawn them closer to God than they ever were before. Others push themselves away from God and uh, they have a harder time spiritually during these times because they blame God for the difficulty in their lives. And that only serves to make the, the tragedies that they're going through worse. And I'm going to pretend to stand up here and be able to tell you and give you trite answers as to why God has allowed what has happened to you to happen. Some of you might be going through some very rough things right now. And there's just not much that any of us can say to you except how sorry we are about that. But one thing that I can say is that in these times, you will have the opportunity to be as close to the creator of the universe and the savior of your soul than you ever could have before. And I pray this for you in this your time of brokenness. But even if there aren't terrible things happening to you, you still must be broken by the reality of the Lord's presence. The fact of, of God right here in our midst should break you of any sense of your own self-sufficiency or your own belief that you can, you can handle life on your own. Because even if things are going great and everything is, is what you want in life to be, it doesn't change the fact that if you're a Christian, that you are in a fierce battle every day of your life. The church of Peter and John's day recognized this as we read in verse 25. It says, why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. But they acknowledge the fact that Christ was murdered and that the church is being persecuted. And although the battle seemed to be against the kings and the rulers of the earth, it was actually much more profound than that. They had a stronger enemy than any political or empirical leader could ever have been. Their battle was against the devil and his followers. And they freely admitted that apart from God's presence and power, that they were no match for their enemy, for Satan and his schemes. They were totally dependent upon the strength of their sovereign Lord. And it is only when we are broken to that point of realizing the same thing, that we will have any real spiritual power in our lives, encountering the living God, meeting with him personally in worship as we've done this morning, should break us of any kind of notion that we might have that we can please God with our own righteousness or that we can combat the forces of darkness without the power of God's presence. So have you come to meet with God this morning? If you have, then you have been broken by the awesomeness of his presence. The fact that God has allowed you to approach his throne would humble you and drive you to your knees, if not literally, at least in your mind. If you have come to church and you have not encountered the living God, then maybe it's time for him to shake you up or to break you up. Or maybe it's just time for him to wake you up. I know some of you might have a hard time staying awake during the sermon, but there are other ways to fall asleep in church that are much more serious than that. And if church is so routine and boring and the work of the Lord is so trivial compared to all the really important things that you have to do, then it's time maybe for the presence of God to wake you up from your slumber. The power and the friendship of the Lord God are available to you this very morning. And if you've come and you've sat through the service without realizing that, wake up. He's here. He's waiting for you. 
if you don't feel that he's here, or if, if God doesn't seem very real to you, well, then maybe that can be your starting point. C.S. Lewis wrote about practicing the absence of God. He said, if we cannot practice the presence of God, it is something to practice the absence of God, to become increasingly aware of our unawareness until we feel like a man in a story who looks in a mirror and finds no face there, or a man in a dream who stretches out his hand to invisible objects and gets no sensation of touch. To know that one is dreaming is to be no longer perfectly asleep. So to feel that God is not here is the first step to finding him. If that's how you feel, then don't just sit there spiritually asleep. Wake up from your dream and seek the Lord. Do something that will alert you to his presence. Pray from your heart instead of just with your mouth or with your hand or following along as somebody else prays. Think about the words that you sung this morning and the words that you will sing and sing them. Let the words from the Bible penetrate instead of just bouncing off as you see them as words on the screen. Seek what can be done by God's power instead of just your own. Ask yourself, what am I attempting to do that could not be accomplished without the power of the Holy Spirit? Is there anything in your life that you're trying to do that you know you can't do without God's help? There's nothing in your life that you're even attempting to do where you don't need God's help. And of course, you're not going to get any sense of his presence. You're asleep. His presence should wake you up. And something else that the presence of God's um, that, that the presence of God will do is to take you up. When you enter that sanctuary of God's presence, be it this room or whatever other place where you know that He's there and He's active in your life, then you will be taken up to a whole new dimension. Yes, it's true that God has condescended down to us and He's come down to our level so that He could relate to us and we to Him. But he also wants to take us up to his level. He wants us to know his glory and his power and his love. And that is what encountering the living God will do. The church in Jerusalem was able to experience this breakthrough from God. But notice when it happened in verse 31. It says, after they prayed, the place was shaken and they were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. It's only after the people had spent time in deep prayer that they encountered the presence of God in such a way that it shook the whole place. And I know it may sound very obvious and simplistic to say that we need to pray in order to experience the presence of God, but it still needs to be said. Many people expect something spiritual so significant to happen in church without really praying about it. And I'm talking more about just the short little prayers that Bud or I might say before or after or during the service. Although those prayers are important, they do indicate that this whole service is surrounded by prayer beginning, middle, and end. But everything that we do in a worship service is really a prayer, or at least it provides the opportunity for you to pray. If you think about it, and you can let it be that for you. Even before the service starts, as Susan and I will often play a prelude, or we have the countdown. And so instead of coming in and say, well, I got two minutes, 33 seconds before somebody up there is going to start talking, you can say, I got two minutes and 33 seconds to prepare my heart and mind to encounter God. Or... All, all the music, the hymns, the praise band songs, if we have an anthem or special music, all those are almost always direct prayers to God or expressions of praise and thanksgiving to him that, that you can join in with. Even the offering, even though we don't pass the offering plates anymore because of COVID, your presentation of your offering and that plate back there can be a prayer to God. You say, this, this is my gift to you, God. This is the first tenth of what you provided for me, and I give it over to you. It is a prayer. And of course, the rest of our church service is receiving from God what he's chosen to say to us through the preaching and the teaching of his word. Now, listening to God is a part of prayer, too. So as you listen to me I, and listen to God's word being said, you're listening to, to what God is saying to you. So have you come today to pray, to speak with, and to listen to the living God? If so, then you cannot possibly leave here without being changed and equipped to live your life for the Lord in this week to come. I mean, after all, when we pray, what is it we're doing? We're just invoking God's presence. There are basically five different aspects to prayer. Uh, there is praise, first of all. The Bible tells us that the Lord inhabits the praises of his people. And so when we praise God, he is instantly here with us in a very unique way. Do you have to think about that? Praising God just brings his presence to us. 
There is also petition. That, that's when we ask things of the Lord because the needs in our life have driven us to seek the Lord's audience and his presence. If you have something that you are wanting to ask somebody else, you usually wait for that right time and opportunity to go and to ask. But when you pray, you're seeking God's presence. You're seeking that audience so that you can ask him what you want to ask him. There is intercession. That is when we pray for others because we are deliberately seeking the mind and heart of the will of God on behalf of others. We want to know what God wants for those that we love who are hurting or going through a hard time. And so by interceding, we are entering into God's presence in a very special way in behalf of others. There is thanksgiving. That is when the gratitude of our heart just compels us to acknowledge in God's presence all of the, the gifts that he's given to us and to acknowledge that he is the giver of all good things. And, of course, with prayer, there is confession, where the awareness of our own sin makes us realize that we cannot even be in God's presence unless he cleanses us from our unrighteousness, and we go to him in confession. And so prayer, real prayer, makes God's presence in this place and in our lives the most concrete reality of all. It's not just something we imagine or we conjure up in our minds. God's presence made that place shake after the people prayed. And let's look at how they prayed that day in Jerusalem. Verse 24. It said, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. They prayed with praise rather than for pity, in spite of the difficult time that they were going through. Yes, they realized that the age of church persecution had now arrived, but rather focusing on that and focusing on themselves and how hard it was going to be, they simply praised the God who made them and who made heaven and earth and everything in them. And if we could do that, if we could just learn to forget about ourselves and our problems and our worries and just praise the God who made us and who saved us, then we would experience his presence in very unforgettable and new and fresh ways. And secondly, we see that the Jerusalem church prayed for power and not protection. In verse 29, it says, Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. The church didn't pray to be protected from the persecution that uh, they knew was coming. They knew it was bound to come. They just prayed that when it came, in the midst of it all, that they would be able to stand firm and they'd be able to speak God's word of boldness and that God would use them in wide, mighty ways to show himself to the world. Now, it's not that it's wrong to pray for protection. We've been doing that an awful lot the last couple of years and, and rightfully so. If you pray for your kids, almost certainly you pray that God would protect them and during that day from all those things out there that, that there are to be protected from. But just think, if we would concentrate more on the power that he gives and less on the protection that he offers, then we might actually have more power in our lives. We might actually see God at work in our everyday events. We might actually feel renewed and empowered every day. Even though life continues to be hard and even though dangers continue to exist and even though there are still things out there that we need to be protected from, if the church would simply learn to, to yearn to, to know God and to have him be the central part of our decisions and our activities, then our worship, those times that we, those precious times when we gather together each week, rather than just be a passing thought or an introduction to the week, would truly be a, a church that encounters the living God, a church that we want it to be. He, he would shake this place upside down. He would break us until we are ready to let him put us back together. He would wake us up out of our dreamy state of routine and ritual, and he would take us up to new heights of glory and peace. So I urge you to come and seek the Lord this morning, next week, Wednesday, whenever we gather together. Seek him and you will find him. May your heart cry out to know the person who gave his life for you and who prepared a place for you to live with him forever. May you encounter the living God.